Hi everyone, it's uh, my pleasure to welcome you to part five of the Surveillance on Humanities Conference and this session is looking at critical perspectives on surveillance, post-colonialism, gender and social control. I'm Associate Professor Gavin Smith and I'm from the ANU School of Sociology and I'm going to be your chair for this really exciting session this evening which I've been looking forward to for a while. Um, I just want to begin by acknowledging uh, country. I'm currently um, on the traditional lands of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people um, and I wish to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging um, and I also acknowledge that sovereignty over this land was never ceded and that struggles for reconciliation and justice remain ongoing. Okay so um, I would like to start off by introducing our first speaker uh, Rachel Joy um, Rachel Joy is a visual artist and intellectual who is working at the confluence of art, law, ethics, history, critical race studies and politics. She views her teaching and research as a process of relational change making and is fascinated by the possibilities that different streams of thinking offer towards new ways of considering critical questions. Although she has many projects in process, Rachel is especially interested in how differing spatio-temporal concepts impact access to and experiences of Western juridical notions of justice. She received a doctorate from the University of Melbourne and currently lectures in criminology at the Australian College of Applied Psychology in Melbourne, Australia. And Rachel is going to talk to us tonight about Through the Glass Darkly, the atmospherics of settler surveillance of Indigenous peoples in Australia. So she'll speak for about 10 minutes um, and then we're going to move on to the next speaker and we'll have questions at the end for Rachel. So over to you, Rachel. Great to have you here tonight. Thanks so much, Gavin. It's great to be here and have the opportunity to, um, to speak with you. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that I'm speaking to you tonight from the lands of the Wurundjeri people, from the Kulin Nations, um, from Narm, sometimes known as Melbourne, and I honour their elders, past, present and emerging. You may wonder why a white woman is speaking tonight to you about uh, settler surveillance of Aboriginal people. I do so from a position of being an ally and interrogating my own and other settler uh, subjectivity. So given we've only got 10 minutes, I'll get going. In the settler colonial project, the spatial management of bodies coalesces with the spatial production of the settler nation. Our European ancestors began their invasion using the bodies of convicts and later the bodies of sheep to fill the land and displace indigenous peoples from their country. Settler colonialism is different from other forms of colonialism in that the settler stays. The settler settled and in that very process of occupation and settlement began to change the environment. We changed the land with our animals and plants, our cities with their sprawling suburbs and our mining of sacred country. We changed the political environment with our lies of terra nullius and subsequent legislative controls over black land and lives. Right from the start, we've refused to see in the mirror the black fella standing beside us, telling us the truth of whose land this is. Settler atmospherics are the normative and constitutive violences of the settler state, tabulating, malforming and constricting Indigenous life. Settler atmospherics do not merely assault the bodies of Indigenous people, but also the very environment in which they exist. This terrorism of the atmosphere can be understood as a settler state offensive that turns the enemy's environment into a weapon against them. The indigenous relationship to country is so profound that an attack on country, such as mining, may be felt in a bodily way by its custodians as an attack on their very being. Politics creates the situations of our lived experience, but it does not function alone. It interacts with space, time, subjectivity, and the lawscapes that enshrine the relational politics that play out on and through bodies. 
In Australia, the racialized lawscapes that negatively impact black bodies to preserve the privileges of white bodies and especially of capital are produced by settler atmospherics. Space is not merely a measurable entity, but rather both a product of and a producer of relations between things. Space is productive of relations between bodies, society, and law. Lawscapes are where the matter of space-time and the immateriality of law, rather, fold into each other in their difference. At their simplest, lawscapes are the rules we submit to, from the regulations and bylaws to international covenants. A lawscape conditions our bodies to behave in certain ways. It exists between bodies and constitutes itself through bodies and the way those bodies interact or are acted upon in the space of the lawscape. Lawscapes are multiple. There are lawscapes that comprise criminal law, environmental law, tax law, etc., and they are everywhere. In their multiplicity and ubiquity, they are also strangely everywhere and nowhere. Because while the products of their actions can be seen at every turn, lawscapes in themselves are imperceptible. Lawscapes produce the embodied experience of governance. When the lawscape has reached its most normalized invisible zenith, it has become an atmosphere. Or to put it another way, this atmosphere is the expression of a lawscape that has become invisible where the power has withdrawn into the shadows to become the arcana imperi of Tacitus. Invisibilization of the lawscape occurs when we're not conscious of the legal frameworks at play in our lives, delimiting and directing them. In settler colonial nations, race blindness is built into the lawscape. Our nation was established on the notion of terra nullius, the rather large oversight of the fact that the continent was already occupied. This reality was conveniently ignored to the profit of the British Empire and its beneficiaries, settlers. Thus, a gargantuan and founding act of race-blind possession established the nation and has been followed by smaller but no less insidious acts of forgetting, silence and solipsism ever since. When race blindness is extant within the settler colonial lawscape, a lawscape that has been normalized to the point of invisibilization, together they produce a to toxic atmospherics that is peculiar to settler colonialism. Those of us who have the luxury not to, lo not to notice race or lawscapes because they do not impact us negatively find it a simple matter to exist in this otherwise toxic atmosphere. We have in fact become complicit in enjoying its technological, economic and legal benefits through a kind of false consciousness or pretense of who we really are and how we come to be here as settlers. Hannah Arndt would remind us that we have unwittingly become beneficiaries to evil in the most banal way. This safe and all you can eat offer is a fantasy world constructed for wealthy white people to consume their way to oblivion by supporting an extraction economy, ignoring the race politics that established and perpetuates the nation and absorbing and normalizing the use of technology to surveil the population and calculate the cost benefit ratio so that it always favors what is fair, read white. In this way, the technologies of governance as part of the lawscape have become invisibilized. Surveillance is one such tool of governance. Surveillance of the indigenous population manifests in the form of the basics card and the laser-like gaze of police officers racially profiling the population as they cruise the neighborhood from the comfort of their climate controlled vehicles. It reveals itself as government welfare checks, records of prior convictions, or outstanding warrants to name a few of its iterations. 
Its racist outcomes are visible in every negative statistic emanating from the criminal justice system. As a tool of governance, it is not perhaps surprising that when surveillance shows us Indigenous people being murdered or left to die in police cells, the lawscape which governs such recordings disappears into the shadows and along with it goes any hope that the criminal justice system will actually perform justice. One might be conscious of the negative outcomes of surveillance, but the lawscape that produces and relies on such tools of governance is strangely absent. This gives the appearance that only the acted upon are extant while the perpetrator vanishes. The squalor is evident, but not the race blind lawscape that created it. This situation per perpetuates the eugenicist lie that Aboriginal peoples are somehow backward, unable to better themselves, a deficit, a problem to be solved. Surveillance performs the biopolitics of control in bodies, but not all bodies experience the racialized lawscape of Setner atmospherics in the same way. We're not all equal within the lawscape. Settler colonial atmospherics are autopoetic. The ultimate goal is a mode of self perpetuation that hides the fact of its own canatus. The bodies captured within that atmosphere are required to be there solely for the purpose of perpetuating settler colonialism. The emergent being of both settlers and natives is fundamentally shaped to serve the needs of settler atmospherics. This means that in coming into being, bodies either emerge to perform settler colonialism as beneficiaries of its lawscapes, or they appear into suspension. Aboriginal bodies are expected to exist in a state of suspension in the settler atmosphere. They are surveilled, counter, counted, controlled, curtailed and incarcerated with the purpose of suspending Indigenous self-determination. The racialized lawscapes of settler atmospherics operate to prevent Indigenous bodies from acting in their own interests and against the interests of a settler state that has indicated it cannot exist concurrently with any other fully realized form of governance. Part of its process of self-perpetuation is that settler colonial atmospherics were actively work to curtail the emergence of other atmospheres and thus of disobedient bodies that might self-actuate to reveal and challenge the invisibilized lawscapes of, the set of settler atmospherics. In the white settler colonial fantasy, there is no place for blackness, so merely appearing is a disobedient act and one that challenges the white nation. Being indigenous and present in your country is to disobey the racialized spatial management of settler colonialism. Being indigenous and refusing the political suspension of settler atmospherics by expressing your sovereignty and demanding personhood for yourself and peoplehood for your kin is seditious. Self-actualization reveals the lie of terra nullius of assimilation and deficit politics. Offering resistance to the occupation is deadly, by which I mean both black fella deadly, brave and beautiful, and white fella deadly, fatal. The death that might be, that death might be swift or it might be slow, executed through the lawscapes of surveillance, welfare, over-policing, remand and prison. Whichever way that life ends, one thing is certain, it will end much sooner than, any, than the life of any non-Aboriginal person in Australia. Indigenous peoples do remain, but in Australia, the chokehold of settler atmospherics makes Aboriginal resistance to the occupation an extraordinary task. To resist the laws of the occupier might be disobedience, but it might also be an act of resistance. And if it is resistance, it is a political act, which means over half the children in detention in Australia at this moment are political prisoners along with their fathers and mothers who were so disproportionately affected by white fellow laws. The settler legal system was built to dispense justice and yet it yields such unjust results, not because it is broken and in need of reform, but because it is the product of a settler state and as such, it was built that way. But if you listen attentively, you will hear the resistance in the rhythm of clapsticks and the stomping of feet 
as the first peoples of this country sing their survival and call up the ancestors to claim their sovereignty, to reveal the truth of belonging. Thank you. Thanks so much, Rachel. That was a really powerful um, and provocative uh, talk. So I'm looking forward to having a discussion about that later on. So thank you very much. Um, okay, moving from Rachel to um, Yvonne Marie Roguez. Um, so might just, just a quick second to uh, switch screens. Um, and go uh, on to Yvonne Marie's uh, biography. So she is an assistant professor at Paris 2 Pantheon Assas University. She teaches UK and US legal English institutions and US constitutional law. She specializes in American studies and her research focuses on the US literature, iconography and visual representations of margins and marginalization and the field of US law and society. Her recent publications include Shopping Carts, Property Rights and the Fourth Amendment, Dealing with Homelessness in Contemporary North America and um, I'm, I, I'll try and pronounce this, but I'm, I think I'll leave you to pronounce that one because uh, my French isn't as good as it probably should be. Um, uh, but I'll, <laughs> it's, 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 I'll leave you to pronounce that one, Yvonne, because I'll probably mess it yeah, up. Yeah, it's, uh, it's an article on um, abortion laws under uh, Trump. Oh, it's great. Good. Yeah, that, well, it's amazing. Um, and Yvonne's going to talk to us tonight about policing the margins, political challenges, and the homeless in California, although I know there might be a slight title change, but um, over to you. We're looking forward to this, Yvonne Marie. Thank you very much, Gavin. And thank, the, thank you to all the organizers for this great um, series of webinars. Um, right, so I'll start to see, yes, the title is Policing the Margins, the Political Challenges of Homelessness in California. So in 2020 in California, an estimated one 108,000 people sleep outdoors and over 40,000 in shelters every night. This is more than any other state in the United States. In December 2019, President Trump used homelessness as a political weapon and posted to a series of tweets attacking Nancy Pelosi. The most famous one was, crazy Nancy should clean up her filthy, dirty district and help the homeless there. One of the characteristics of California's place and complexity when considering its homelessness problem is that it's not always the most progressive laboratory of democracy. It accounts for about 24% of the total homeless population in the USA, while it represents 12% of the country's population. And it provides for a very high number of court cases challenging what is referred to as the criminalization of homelessness. In many academic fields, such as economics, sociology, legal and political studies, two main topics divide scholars and provide for rich arguments. Firstly, the reasons for the increase of homelessness since the 1980s, and secondly, whether a part of the homeless population actually chooses to remain homeless. A further, less vigorous point of contention concerns the subcategorization of the homeless population, as it is extremely diverse and seems to defy categorization. The consequences of the increase of homelessness led local governments to regulate and control the homeless population using an array of ordinances. Policing aims to re-establish the rule of society and to reintegrate those who fall on the outside. In the mind of the settled community, a mix of real concerns and fantasy also takes place, creating fear and the notion that the homeless have to disappear. This paper aims to highlight and synthesize the issues regarding the surveillance and control of the homeless population by different bodies, the government, courts, police forces, homelessness advocates, and the general population. The concept of public is at the heart of this study. It presents questions relating to the place of the homeless in public space as opposed to private space, as part of the public, as in the general population, and as the object of public policy. The dichotomy between private and public spheres can be extended to the perception and treatment of the homeless problem as either an individual or a collective problem. Policing, as well as court decisions and urban laws, aim to control the homeless population as a whole, with blanket regulations that focus on their current visibility rather than their rehabilitation and long-term housing needs. The aim of this policing covers all aspects of the usual goals of surveillance, security, economic control and growth, social harmony, and welfare. 
An oversimplistic proposition to solve homelessness is arguably providing affordable or subsidized housing. However, the actions that are required to achieve that goal expose a web of intricate and intractable issues which negate any simple solution. The prism of surveillance studies is particularly adapted to the issue of homelessness, as the latter also requires a multidisciplinary approach, as described by David Lyon, in order to achieve balanced comprehension. While homelessness is hugely politicized and most public policies appear to serve electoral agendas and public interests, it brings up many sociological and philosophical issues which are linked to the public's perception. If institutions where surveillance is exercised are meant to render those inside visible, and this is Foucault in Discipline and Punish, shelters and rehabilitation centers aim to make them invisible that is ultimately blending in with the rest of society and disappearing. And this is closer to Baudrillard in America. The homeless are often stigmatized and perceived as a problem that everyone wants to solve without providing the necessary means to that end, as the homeless are often seen as unredeemable and therefore a lost cause. And this is linked to a belief in the culture of poverty that places homeless people in a category which deems them a waste of resources. Anti-homeless ordinances arise out of pressure on politicians from the population and more particularly business owners. These laws then become part of the political arsenal of neoliberal and conservative groups. It is the public nature of homelessness which reflects its visibility and therefore causes the incentive for policing. Homelessness redefines urban areas, and this led to the creation of social crimes in order to clean up these areas for real estate or cultural purposes. The mental image of the role of the homeless was used to justify the passing of those laws, including uh, Rudy Giuliani's famous broken window image. Some scholars see the issue of the visibility of the homeless and the desire for their invisibility as the heart of the paradoxes defining responses to homelessness. Indeed, many homeless advocates do not wish the homeless to disappear from city centers, pavements and roadsides, as they would then also disappear from the population's consciousness. Paradoxes add up, resulting in a blurring of intentions and a form of discouragement for all sides of the political spectrum. Even though the two opposite points of view regarding the treatment of homelessness meet in their rejection of current policies. In terms of surveillance, it is ironic to notice that control is applied through a process of invisibilization rather than the increased visibility, rather than increased visibility and focus. City ordinances criminalizing homelessness can be defined as indirect. They focus on the population as a whole, rather than the homeless in particular, considering the quality of life and safety of the community. The different types of anti-homeless ordinances include sleeping and camping bans on public lands or sidewalks, anti-panhandling and anti-loitering ordinances, police sweeps, and bans against charities to house or clothe the homeless. Punishment includes fines and sometimes incarceration. The secondary impact of these bans is the need felt by some cities to outdo other cities in order to avoid a wave of new homeless people seeking refuge in less restrictive zones. There is an overwhelming consensus among scholars and academics that these policies and regulations are counterproductive. Criticism focuses on spatial issues, as moving the homeless from one place to another does not provide any solutions, and cost, as applying these ordinances is proved to be more expensive than housing programs. Up until the end of the 2000s, it was largely considered that courts were rather indifferent to the problems of the homeless. While it was in their power to decide on the constitutionality of these ordinances and push for legislative reform. Since 2014, this trend has shifted in favor of the homeless. They have become part of the conversation, regardless of whether the outcome of court decisions was in their favor. Constitutional principles in these cases include vagueness, uh, the First Amendment, the Fourth, the Eighth, and the Fourteenth Amendments. The impact of these cases on public policy is undeniable, and changes in policy following consent decrees, agreements, and settlements 
sometimes precede court decisions. And this was recently the case when trying to deal with the COVID-19 pandemic. Epidemics and infections, either as a reality or a point of comparison, are a common concern when dealing with the homeless. One efficient but ambiguous tool was developed this time. It's what is known as government-sanctioned or safe campsites. And the panopticon-like shape of the San Francisco sanctioned camp is rather astonishing. And I would like to share the, this picture with you so that you can have a look at it for a minute. So you have this time, this is the sanctioned camp. Right, sorry, going back to my paper. So the statue seems to be watching over all tents and each tent is allocated an enclosed space that it's not supposed to leave. COVID-19 has brought in the necessity for a new form of surveillance, which looks more, looks more like a prison than a shelter. And this gridding of the population makes homeless people look like pieces on a game of checkers or chess, and it participates in a sense of dehumanization for control purposes. Ironically, the pandemic has also brought to life the dreams of homeless advocates through purchasing motels, waiving environmental and regulatory hurdles for emergency shelters, and expanding federal funding. Very recent reports in August 2020 are actually optimistic and show that a disaster seems to have been avoided. Fresh air may have been an environmental advantage. The impact of tobacco use, the immunity of the homeless people are also under study. The lack of movement of the homeless and social distancing from the rest of the community may also be an explanation. Although Margot Kuschel, who's a professor of medicine at UC San Francisco, said that an easier explanation is the data on homeless infections is poor and the homeless community is cut off from the rest of society. So ironically, the very title of this paper spells out failure. Policing the margins will not make them disappear. It will, in the very short term, reassure the population, but only an adapted, flexible and evolving multiplicity of solutions can help those who wish to reintegrate mainstream society. While those willing to remain on those margins might not appear as visible and therefore may be left free to dwell and move where and as they see fit. COVID-19 stands as a double-edged sword, provoking unprecedented solutions while potentially sowing the seeds for a new devastating crisis. Some of the issues mentioned by Yelena last Thursday apply to the homeless, and particularly the assessment of the cost and benefit of policies. And here they must be viewed in terms of social benefit and social cost, and financial benefit, financial cost. And the US seems to be caught in a trap where the financial cost of these policies is higher than their social benefit, and where financial benefit comes at a very high social cost. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Yvonne Marie. That was another really amazing talk, um, which is just and lots of I think some interesting intersections with uh, with Rachel's talk too. So, um, moving now on to the final speaker for tonight is um, Claire Rebel, um, who is also from Pantheon Assas. Um, so, Claire Rebel is uh, an assistant professor at the Pantheon Assas University, Paris too. She also teaches literature in, at Paris Sciences et Lettres. Her PhD dissertation centered on panopticism in 18th century Gothic literature. She's published articles on Gothic authors such as Anne Radcliffe, Bram Stoker, Arthur Machen, and is also looking at reworkings of Gothic tropes in contemporary works, as well as literary variations on panopticism. Recent publications include an essay in the Law and Literature Journal on the role of fiction in Jeremy Bentham's penal theory. Um, and tonight, Claire Rebell is gonna to talk to us about gender and surveillance in Margaret Atwood's fiction, from bodily harm to the testament. So I'm really looking forward to hearing about this. So over to you, please, Claire. Thanks uh, very much. So um, within the 10 minutes I have, I'm going to first raise a few questions of methodology, uh, and then I will give some illustrations from the novels I have uh, selected. So Surveillance Studies Needs Gender and Sexuality. Um, that was the, the title of an editorial of a special issue of the Surveillance and Society Journal that was published in 2009. And a few years later in 2016, 
the editors of a book called Expanding the Gaze, Gender and the Politics of Surveillance still noted uh, a significant gap in the limited systematic attention paid to gender. So Foucault in particular has been blamed for describing a modern subject who is by default a generic he, thereby neglecting gender. But the problem is of course more general. Now, uh, what may gendering surveillance mean? Well, among other things, uh, recognizing the gender specific norms which may be at play in the way certain forms of surveillance operate. This is, for example, what Coronas and Hardy do when they look at cervical cancer screening as a form of medical surveillance. More generally, the research which has been produced uh, tends to focus on the subjectivity and the experience of surveillance and to study the local, the discursive, the performative and the embodied. Uh, here I'm quoting from the editorial. So the differential impacts of practices which are socially located and embodied. So from that perspective, Atwood's fiction is particularly interesting because she has a long running interest in surveillance and often depicts the experience of the female surveil subject from the inside. Now, any discussion of gender in Atwood's novels needs to come with a caveat regarding the author's relationship to feminism, which is a label she embraces rather reluctantly. Um, for instance, she writes that The Helmet's Tale is indeed a dystopia from the female point of view, but that uh, this does not make it a feminist dystopia, except, I quote, insofar as giving a woman a voice and an inner life will always be considered feminist by those who think women ought not to have these things. So the corpus selected here includes six novels spanning Atwood's whole career, starting with Bodily Harm, um, Atwood's fifth novel published in 1981, and ending with The Testaments, which is the sequel to The Helmet Tale that was published last year. And I also used the Madden trilogy as a sort of counter example to the other works. So it is common for The Helmet Tale and the Madden trilogy to be discussed together as dystopias about the near future, offering indirect reflections of contemporary society with incidentally a strong surveillance component. Atwood describes them as eustopias. Uh, so it is a word which combines dystopia and utopia because for her, uh, each contains a latent version of the other. Now, even though bodily harm is not uh, technically a eustopia, it displays some characteristics of what Atwood calls speculative fiction in that the protagonist travels to the Caribbean and returns to Canada with a changed outlook on what passes as normal in North America. And her thoughts on the plane back confirm the affinity of the novel with speculative fiction. So, uh, quoting, she feels as if she's returning after a space trip, a trip into the future. It's her that's been strange, but it will seem as if everyone else has, there's been a warp. They've been living in a different time. So in all six novels, the travel in space and or time creates critical distance. Now, Bonnily Harm interests me because it complexifies the male gaze. Being watched and interiorizing the male gaze is supposed to be central to the construction of the female subject. This is the point made a long time ago by Berger in Ways of Seeing or a movie in Visual Pleasure and Narrative Cinema. In the first part, I also draw on recent work by Hilla Koskela on CCTV cameras and policing work in which she demonstrates that the gaze is actually still coded as masculine um, in these practices. Um, the opening scene of bodily harm um, almost is almost a direct transposition of Koskela's point. Um, Reni comes home to find two policemen who inform her that her apartment has been entered by someone who has left a coiled rope on her bed and a parallel is clearly drawn between the intruder and one of the policemen who has a very patronizing attitude. After the event, Rennie cannot shake the feeling that she is being watched, and she interiorizes the voyeuristic gaze to the extent that, quote, she begins to see herself from the outside as if she was a moving target in someone else's binoculars. The anonymous intruder is a faceless stranger uh, who has numerous avatars in the novel. The generic anonymous stalker thus embodies the social norms that threaten women and the violence that stems not from single deviant individuals, but from a larger complex of social institutions, narratives and conditions. And here I'm quoting from Melly's analysis in Empire of Conspiracy. Another interesting point in the same novel is how it articulates different types of gaze. 
Reni is a woman, but she's also a white woman visiting a post or even neo-colonial space, a Caribbean island, which additionally breeds paranoia because of political surveillance. So we have a parallel between the female body and the body politic, which connects the male gaze with the medical gaze as Rennie is recovering from cancer, the tourist gaze and political surveillance. Now, moving on to the next novel, um, as is well known, The Handmaid's Tale depicts a totalitarian regime which targets fertile women who are forced into surrogacy. What is striking, I think, in the surveillance techniques which are used for that purpose is how low tech they are. Um, for instance, the medical monitoring of the handmaids is quite basic. The main mechanisms on which the Republic of Gilead um, bases its power are actually social sorting, which is um, described by David Lyon in a couple of uh, books. For instance, with the creation of the categories unwoman or gender traitor um, and psychological manipulation so that handmaids monitor themselves and their peers. But what I want to insist on in this rather grim novel and its sequel is actually resistance to surveillance, which is achieved by subverting the gaze. Indeed, surveillance systems are not monolithic or foolproof. Uh, as was suggested the other day, surveillance is indeed messy uh, and can be multidirectional in the way it operates. Atwood's protagonists survive because they adapt to their surroundings, which includes exploiting the loopholes and the blind spots in the surveillance system. Uh, so here I analyze the motif of the peephole or the crack in the wall, which is recurrent in the novel. And I show that these microscopic spaces enable the characters to reclaim some privacy and identity. I also show how the protagonist tries to subvert the surveillance gaze by turning it into a look of desire, which she can use to regain agency. In the Testaments, uh, the downfall, and I have to, I should probably give a spoiler warning at this point if you haven't read it, uh, the downfall of Gilead is brought about by Aunt Lydia, uh, who has become the embodiment of female surveillance in ways which I do not have the time to de detail here, but it's interesting to see how we get the, uh, the, the point of view of the insider. So she uses, Aunt Lydia uses the antiquated technology of the microdot uh, inserted in a young woman's body to send the secret files of Gilead out of the country. So again, we have embodied female resistance on a micro level, as well as subversion from the inside. So the last part of the paper looks at the Madame trilogy in which gender is actually no longer prominent when it comes to surveillance. Um, in terms of time frame, uh, the narrative present corresponds to a post-apocalyptic world, which is also post-human and post-feminist. And in this post-apocalyptic world, most of the human population has been eradicated by a global virus. And surveillance is actually a thing of the past, which has collapsed with everything else. But the world before corresponds to the near future for readers. Now, in this dystopia, the gated communities where the elite scientists live are surveillance ridden with a combination of bugs, drones, CCTV cameras, biometrics, and I cannot resist, it, resist mentioning the dorks, digital online rapid capture specialists who track people on the internet with specialized algorithms. Here, surveillance is not in the hands of the state, but of corporations who collect, store, and use personal data for commodification and political repression. And yet, even in that scenario, surveillance can be subverted. On the black market, characters can get new fingerprints and voice print. They can have their ears recontoured in addition to getting something called DNA infusion. So that in fact, genetic data is not the final marker of identity. To give one last example, New New York even has a street of dreams where people shop around for quote, gender, sexual orientation, height, color of skin and eyes. So here um, we can see that gender, and I will end on this point, is really a factor of biological identification among others, rather than a social construct as it was um, in the other novels. Thank you. Thanks so much, Claire. And um, thanks to all of you for, for keeping the time so well. I was really impressed um, and it means that we've got some some good time now. Uh, we've got about, yeah, 40, oh no, sorry, it's 540. So we've got about 20 minutes and we might run a little bit over should the Q&A take us that way. Um, so I guess I'll just open up um, any questions 
from the attendees. Uh, first of all, we'll see if anyone's got any questions for any of the speakers or for all of the speakers. There's also the Q&A box that um, is a good place to post questions in there. Just maybe while we're uh, waiting for some uh, questions, I might just uh, ask it just as a chair, sort of steal the right to um, ask a question of all of you. Like I think all the talks really spoke beautifully to each other in different ways. And I, I was just I was struck by um, the kind of the uh, the term of invisibilization appearing in 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 both well, in the first two papers, but also kind of interestingly appearing in Claire's work in different ways around what's seen and what's unseen. So I guess just wanted to. Um, maybe posit to all of you um, a question around um, resistance as well, because I think, uh, you know, it seems interesting, This a lot of this is about what is seen and what's unseen and who's who's doing the looking and who's who's being looked at. And I guess I'm just interested, particularly for um, uh, Rachel, to start with maybe um, around about, you know, where you see some modes of resistance to this kind of like what, you know, seem you describe really beautifully as quite hegemonic power and and um yeah and is is so is kind of what you're maybe suggesting from your perspective about trying to um you know how indigenous peoples aboriginal torres strait Islander peoples are trying to make are making themselves visible in different ways um so i'm kind of kind of interested in that that mm. relates to visibility and invisibility and invisibility sure thanks kevin um yeah i I do think there was a real resonance between our papers and this um, question of the visible and the invisible. And I think um, in terms of resistance, um, one thing that really struck me with Claire's paper and mine was, um, and I didn't get to speak to this particularly well in, in my paper, but the idea of art revealing truths um, you know, and it's it's uh, perhaps goes to Cezanne and his quote about, um, to paraphrase him, the art makes visible that which is invisible. And I think Atwood's novels are revealing um, um, the embodied res resistance as Claire um, was speaking about. But in terms of indigenous resistance, um, I think perhaps one of the most exciting and challenging forms of indigenous resistance um, potentially is the idea of um, performing ceremony. So in terms of law, L-A-W and L-O-R-E, Australian, uh, successive Australian governments have, have really targeted um, Aboriginal culture, um, particularly language, dance, um, song and story for repression. And so because they are so integral to um, uh, the way that Indigenous law is uh, expressed, um, I think the, you know, the, the bodily um, expression of painting up for ceremony couldn't be more powerful in terms of expressing um, law in both senses. Um, uh, and, and I think really offering, um, yeah, powerful resistance because this was supposed to disappear. Um, and so holding ceremony and um, expressing through painting and story and song, um, and the, the decision-making processes of elders uh, is really um, important to, to expressing resistance. Thanks, Rachel. Um, maybe Yvonne Marie, do you want to, um, again, just maybe come in on, the, on that, some of those points around, um, you know, marginal, marginality. It was interesting, you, I, I, you noted that um, some of the homeless people are kind of involved in, um, you know, are kind of collaborating and contributing to some of the, uh, some of the kinds of policies that are emerging in that space is that is that is that right that they're kind of having some kind of um integration into um and, and yeah just i'm just kind of interested again too about that uh sense of potentially modes of empowerment that might that might come in with the most unlikely kinds of guises 
this come this would come more from homeless advocates who are extremely you know mobilized and and really work for um um just a bit of recognition really of their condition but there was something um if you don't mind that i was just thinking about um when rachel was mentioning um lawscapes and this is something that i, I found i mean i found that word um fascinating really and there's one thing um that i didn't have the time to develop but i think it, it fits in with this idea of the lawscape being everywhere and invisible and this is when it comes to um hostile what we call hostile architecture and and um, and it's a really really interesting point because um it's widely used you know in in california and uh, there was actually the, the state has been described as a nasty offender in the game of, of hostile architecture. And it's, a, it's another form of privatization of public space. So this, uh, th there's an interesting link um, which could be elaborated between um, the privatization of public space and the lawscape, this sort of invisible hand uh, from the, the, the government that takes it over and negates the presence of, therefore, the homeless because they're, they, they fall you know, they're apart, they, they're on those margins and they're not supposed to be there. Mm -hmm. um, so the, all these, um, I found uh, the, this idea of the lawscape very interesting. Thank you, Rachel. Mm -hmm. and, and it creates that, that toxic atmosphere that, you know, would, in the case of the homeless, also be applicable. I think, you know, there's so many um, meeting points with um, the Indigenous um, situation and with the homeless people and of course for many indigenous people they are both indigenous and homeless so yeah um i think that that yeah interesting to see those connections um claire do you want to um uh, come in with anything on, on there as well around um that sort of um invisibilization visibilization resistance kind of sort of a dynamic yeah this is a, there's a paradox which is um, highlighted um, in uh, expanding the gaze um, so gender in the politics of surveillance which is that women are made both invisible and hyper visible and i think that's a point which is really well illustrated by uh, the handmaids um, in uh, the handmaid's tale because um, as you know, social sorting is um, materialized in the various uniforms that social groups have to wear. Uh, so handmaids wear red and Alfred notes at one point, she says, red is so visible. And of course, uh, when you have that uh, all covering red uh, kind of dress, it's impossible to escape because you're so visible. And yet at the same time, because it's a uniform, um, and because the handmaids are given new names, um, which are related to the um, commander uh, they have been allotted to, um, they are deprived of their identities. And in the Testaments, one of the younger characters does say that um, uh, the handmaids all look the same. And indeed they do because they're wearing the same uniform. Uh, so they are made, also, they are made uh, hyper visible because of their red uh, uniform, but at the same time, because the uniform deprives them of their identities, it also makes them invisible. They merge uh, in that uh, group that they're, um, a part of. And um, the other mechanisms which um, Gilead relies on include controlling what the handmaids see, obviously with the, the hats, uh, which limit um, their, uh, their scope of vision. Uh, Alfred says that they have learned to see the world in gasps. Um, and the handmaids also interiorize the idea um, of how what they must look like from the outside. So for example, there is a passage in which Alfred and Ofglen are looking at the wall where the bodies of um, executed people are hanging. And she says, it doesn't matter um, whether we'll look, we're supposed to look. Um, so they are aware uh, of um, the, the, the spectacle they're supposed to give to the um, um, outsiders. And in, uh, to get back to the first novel, In Bodily Harm, um, this notion of invisibility is a bit different. Um, Rennie travels to the Caribbean uh, to escape from uh, breast cancer, her lover leaving the stalker incident, which are actually interconnected episodes. And she wants to be invisible when she gets there. It's also part of her being a journalist. 
Uh, she wants to blend in so that she can write her piece on travel on a Caribbean island. Um, but um, the novel is full of allusions to the visual with uh, binoculars, telescopes, cameras, etc. And um, the irony is that Rennie actually doesn't see. She looks as a tourist. She is, it's her function to look, but she doesn't see, which means that she doesn't understand the political reality of the island she's on. And uh, part of the um, novel is about how she actually learns um, how to see um, what is around her. And this includes realizing that she's been under surveillance from the very moment she got off the plane. Uh, the, the island is really, um, um, really has a strong paranoid atmosphere. Um, she runs into people she's never met who know what she does for a living, for instance. Um, and so, yes, um, as the novel unfolds, she understands that she's been, uh, she wasn't invisible at all. In fact, she was very conspicuous as a single white woman traveling. And uh, people actually thought she was an undercover CIA agent. Um, so, um, again, we have this um, uh, play on vis hyper-visibility and invisibility, but in, with a slightly different um, approach. Thanks, Claire. I was just going to say, uh, Yvonne Marie and Rachel, maybe just a, a question, and then Anne's uh, got one as well, I think, coming as well. Um, just about the digital culture that we're kind of obviously deeply embedded in now, and whether you see you know, this kind of uh, space of kind of like, you know, constant surveillance, both from the ground, middle, you know, meso, macro, uh, all these different kinds of directions of surveillance and sous surveillance, these kind of things, whether you see some of these practices unsettling some of those dominant modes of power, because I'm thinking particularly for, for, for you, Rachel, about um, the ways in which certain police brutality has been caught um, on a digital technology and circulated, broadcasted. And I'm just wondering what role that kind of multiplex of visibility might have in some forms of politics um, and, and that kind of like affective contagion uh, of these images spilling in different contexts when previously, you know, uh, it would have just been that kind of direct, you'd have to directly physically be there and it had to be an oral kind of narrative or, or, or evidence. Now you've got this kind of visual culture where it's circulating around so much. I just want to put that to both of you, if that's okay. Mm, yeah, um, I think um, if I might, there's been a lot of talk about the fact that um, it's now uh, in this age of mobile phones um, and their, their increased coverage and accessibility that means that we have a lot more information about um, police brutality um, against Aboriginal people and people of colour generally in Australia. Um, however, in regional areas where um, mobile phones are still less common, um, there a lot of that violence still goes uh, unreported because Aboriginal people aren't believed necessarily when they claim you know what's happened to them, and they have no way of proving that it's happened to them. Um, if it happens in the back of a police wagon and people don't have um, body cameras on, you know, that sort of thing. So, yeah, definitely um, there is an increase in reporting, particularly in urban areas, but in Australia the urban regional divide is huge in terms of uh, Aboriginal disadvantage. And it's really important to be conscious of how that plays out in the um, ability of people to use um, technology to their advantage. But definitely um, people are doing that for sure. Um, so, yeah, it, it does make a difference, but it's not the only thing. Yes. Um, okay. So I'll, I'll just um, link what I would say, what you were just saying, Rachel, about technology, using technology to their advantage. And it is true that you can find um, a lot of police sweeps in LA and around and in California in general on YouTube. 
So there's an awful lot of them. And um, also you can find short videos on newspaper websites such as the LA Times and the New York Times. There's a, a multiplicity of these videos and they all tend to be, um, you know, denouncing um, um, the, the police practices in, in general and all tend to be in favour of, of the homeless with a very humane and compassionate um, look at all this. Uh, there's one video maybe that, I, that I'll mention shortly um, because there's this uh, district judge who is um, um, presiding over this um, this hearing that took place in, in March and that, that hearing is, is a little bit surreal. Uh, this district judge is uh, Judge David O. Carter is, and has become a bit of a celebrity now uh, because he, he, walks among, um, he walked among homeless camps uh, during the beginning of the pandemic. Um, asking the homeless how they were and and helping them, um, um, you know, with with um, remaining, um, well, staying safe and careful um, with uh, with their daily lives. And um, the what was really um, interesting, and that video has has become quite viral. Um, um, of this judge who looks like, you know, extremely, is extremely elegant and um, looks a little bit like Harriet Fonda. And he walks among um, the homeless and really caring for them. So yes, I would, I would um, say that those videos, it's mostly in the form of videos. And they are um, really um, in compassionate and in favor of, on, on, from the point of view of the homeless rather than the police. Thanks. I'm just going to come to Anne now because she's got some uh, comments for the speaker. So over to you, Anne. Um, um, thank you, Gavin. Um, yes, I had um, the um, first two comments I had were similar to yours. Uh, it was about resistance um, as, as, a, as a common thread between the three presentation and also the visible and visible divide. Um, I'd like to come back to resistance because I had a quick look through the, uh, the presentations of the, um, the, the conferences of the rest of the series. And when you think about it, the, the issue of, of, conf of resistance was, was there at some stage in almost each one of the um, uh, talks, but it wasn't highlighted in the same way. It wasn't as prominent as um, as it is when you're actually dealing with um, art, and that's something that you um, that um, Rachel uh, brought up. Um, also, um, um, uh, when it comes to visible and invisible, I'd like to pass on. Uh, I'm not going to add anything because you've already discussed it, but I'd like to pass on a comment from Desmond um, uh, Manderson, who says um, uh, this question of visible and invisible is a very helpful way of connecting recognition and surveillance. Another area in which this plays out is graffiti the question of who has the right to be visible in the city, and on the other hand, graffiti as making visible an invisible or unrecognized presence. The politics of graffiti and the politics of homelessness is perhaps uh, parallel. So um, um, that was one um, comment, and maybe um, the speakers might want to uh, react on that. I had a Third comment that you haven't stolen from me, uh, which is um, uh, maybe a parallel that I'd like to draw from the uh, with the other um, presentations or through the series. And we started with uh, um, a keynote speech um, by Professor Seebeck um, on um, COVID app. And, um, and she is the um, head of the CEO of the um, Cyber Institute. So something very technical and also um, which highlighted the um, um, importance of um, very uh, advanced technology. Uh, used um, in in surveillance and and that um, idea runs through most of the presentations up to today where in fact what we see is um, going back to maybe more traditional forms of poli policing um, where you're looking at rather than uh, high technology um, uh, input uh, or surveillance you're looking at in, in, in instead low low tech surveillance, uh, which rests rather on social sorting, 
uh, rather than high tech. Um, there's just one little thing is um, uh, Claire's, uh, the last part of Claire's presentation where she talks of the uh, Matt Adams um, series where um, uh, there, there is uh, a lot of, of, of high tech uh, references um, in, in that series, but, but not in the, um, um, the, the other uh, 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 books she, she, she talked about. Um, I had also one um, comment, an extra comment, I'm sorry, I'm, 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 I talk a lot, but um, about what um, even Marie Roger said about the panopticon um, and the, um, the picture um, that you, uh, you shared with us. Um, and well, yes, to a certain extent, um, you might want to see this as an echo of the panopticon with the um, central statue um, and maybe it'd be interesting also to try and see who the statue of which person is, is there and whether it's still there now, um, because it might have been toppled down. Um, Part but, of it has moved indeed, yes, yeah. because it, it represented a, a Native American Indian uh, being kind of petted. So that's, uh, yeah, that, that part is gone. That part is gone too, okay. So symbolically it's quite interesting to see the reversal. Yeah. Um, but... Um, so yes, I agree with you, but um, when you think about it a little bit deeper, what you see in fact, what I see particularly is, is it's, it's the panopticon without this central inspector. There's, there's no central inspector. And if you forget about the, 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 the statue in the middle, what you see is a grid. And you see the grid as you see it in, in, in Foucault. Uh, and, and the grid is, uh, the example of the grid is what he uses to describe the way in which in the 17th century, 16th, 17th century, or even in the Middle Ages, you dealt with the plague. And maybe the grid is something which is typical, typical of the way in which you deal with epidemics, um, you know, from, from the very um, depth of, of history. That's it. Um, I'm done. Thank you. Thank you so much for um, your, these three fascinating talks. Who wants to go first? Rachel? Um, yeah, look, I, I can. I, uh, I suppose I'm responding here to both the social sorting, which Indigenous people uh, you know, cannot avoid because they are so visible to pick up on Claire's point about the, the um, red cap wearing um, women, that Indigenous peoples here are profiled by the police and, and they cannot ignore, ignore that. That's um, something that uh, impacts them hugely. Um, and to the point about recognition, I think this is a fascinating thing because we have a whole campaign here in Australia around recognition of Aboriginal people. And um, it's been problematised in that the recognition of Indigenous peoples in the Constitution, of course, is um, supposed to be about, you know, legal recognition, um, but the document is the document of settlers. So why would Indigenous peoples who haven't ceded their, so their sovereignty be at all interested in being recognised by this, um, this document? Um, so many Indigenous activists would um, say that what they want is not to be recognised on white people's terms, but to demand a treaty um, which um, acknowledges their difference um, and the importance of that difference. Um, so I, I know this is perhaps not exactly where Desmond was probably going with his recognition idea, but I think it's pertinent to this, this particular conversation. I, I think that's a really interesting point, Rachel. And I mean, I it does sort of to get to the heart in some ways of some of the issues with face recognition. Um, you know, because it's something I've just been, what, what you've just mentioned is something I've been thinking around about how these, these technologies work, which um, I mean, it's too long to talk about in this forum, but there's something interesting about, you know, which faces they recognise uh, from the crowd um, and this kind of weird um, irony of like, you know, the, the sort of the, the wider politics of recognition of absence 
Um, and, and yeah, and undoubtedly these cameras at some point, these softwares will no doubt, um, that at this point, apparently, technically, they're not as good at recognising people of colour and their faces, but I, I'm sure very soon they, they will and they will fixate on those faces. Um, so there's that kind of, again, I, I see your really interesting notion of the, the lawscape appearing, manifesting in that technological veneer. Um, through through these kinds of you know um, avant garde techniques of control, which facial recognition is but one. So I just that's just something I think is really interesting about this weird politics of recognition and un, unrecognition and not wanting to be seen. Um, but anybody else want to jump in, Claire, Yvonne, Marie? Do you want to? Yeah. Yes, if I can just um, add a little something from what Anne was saying. Um, what's really interesting, so yes, low-tech surveillance, obviously, is what we're looking at with the work of police forces and the enforcement of all these um, ordinances. But what is really interesting in terms of resistance is that it's, it's proximity that leads to resistance. Basically, anyone who comes close to with the homeless, who um, even the police themselves, when they when they actually get it, you know, care not care, but when they're in contact in daily contact with the homeless, they come to know them, and when they know them, they realize the complexity of the issue and that they have to um, they have to consider the individual rather than the collective. The homeless as a group does not exist. And this is what they, they realize. What's also interesting in terms of resistance is the very long list of yearly reports and litigation manuals that are drafted by all sorts of um, homeless advocates and associations that um, are extremely detailed. I mean, they're, they're all the 170, 180 pages every year uh, renewed with new data and, and um and those litigation manuals are, are manuals of, of resistance in a way, and how to fight against those ordinances. So that, that's, that's, that's a lovely point, and particularly about the distance and the and the sort of the personalization or depersonalization, dehumanization, and that sort of that sense of touch uh, or, or 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 proximity. I really think that's a lovely point about how that can trouble some of these regimes of power. I think that's lovely. That's uh, Claire, do you, do you want to just come in with anything there? We're just getting towards the end of the time, but would you like to? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure, thank you. And I was thinking about uh, Anne's point about the fact that we are, we have talked about uh, very advanced technology and also more traditional forms of policing. Um, I think the interest of looking at surveillance in Atwood's novels across several decades is that we have um, really a wide range um, of forms of surveillance and uh, that it leads us to question the role of technology in surveillance. Does really surveillance need that, need that or not? Um, if we look at body the harm, I would say um, we have rather traditional uh, forms of surveillance. In the helmet tale, the event that triggers the, um, well, rather one of the means that Gilead uses to target women is to use credit card information. Any account that has an F uh, at the beginning of the number is shut down. And so this shows, I think, the beginning of um, maybe Atwood's concerns about the use of technology as a way to identify um, uh, and classify people. And then, of course, in uh, the Mad Adam trilogy, uh, we have uh, the most cutting edge technology, um, which is enlisted on the side um, of surveillance. Um, now, especially, I remember listening to um, uh, Jennifer's paper the other day and about all the, the chilling intrusions into uh, privacy in terms of DNA and, um, and personal information. And by contrast, the panopticon almost looks cute and, and nice uh, by, compare, by contrast. Um, but the, I think the, one of the other uh, points related to technology uh, in Atwood's fiction, which is uh, very well developed in an article which was actually written by a, a, a student of, uh, of Jay Clayton uh, in the Journal of Literature and, and Science, is about the notion of privacy. And I think, again, looking at Atwood's fiction um, across several decades, there is this shift uh, from privacy as concealment of information um, in the way in the helmet tale, uh, when people stay off the grid and conceal information, um, they remain safe, to uh, privacy as the control of the use of personal data, which is what we have in the Madadam trilogy. Uh, here, what matters is really um, 
who gets to decide what is done with the personal data. And again, this is something which is made possible by increased um, and improved uh, technology. So again, I think from the point of view of um, the issue of genetic privacy, uh, Atwood, Atwood's fiction also makes it possible to um, question the, or at least raise the question of uh, the role of technology uh, in surveillance and, um, and the management of privacy. Yeah. Thanks so much, Claire. Um, it's getting towards the end of the time, but Yelena just wants to make a, maybe a quick, a very quick last final comment before we close. So Yelena, would you like to just make your comment? Oh, all right. Um, thank you. I don't want to disappoint because it started off as a very narrow law focused um, thing. From a lawyer's perspective, I have, was tickled to try and redeem the law um, from Rachel's very illuminating um, talk in particular. But I want to thank all three of you for presenting today and all of the discussion has been uh, fascinating. But on my point, I might maybe ask um, whether there's uh, a capacity to separate the law as it is used by the state against vulnerable individuals, including indigenous peoples as individuals and as a group, and the law that might be um, upheld, interpreted by the courts, which might have a protective or liberating effect. And it's a very difficult uh, topic. And Rachel, you mentioned treaty. And in New Zealand, we have this treaty, which used to be a nullity, as the courts said, but then in the 90s, the courts took it and incorporated it into the traditional common law to try and create a partnership that binds the Crown to, to take into account Maori and Iwi uh, interests. And very recently in Australia, we had the High Court interpret the Constitution in a way that really incorporates that fundamental realization of the connection between Indigenous peoples and the land. Uh, which determined individual um, rights, shall we say, under the constitution. So I wonder, my question is, is there a way of looking at the law as um, both a weapon that can be used against indigenous peoples in particular, but also as a resource, or is it actually all embedded within that um, oppressive vision of sovereignty that is not theirs? Oh, um... I'm probably going to come down on the ladder because I guess I see as um, take a systems approach to it, and I think you know within the atmospherics of the the settler state, um, the the law is created by that system. So you know we can talk about native title um, and the limitations um, on that. You know. <laughs> the way that it was perhaps originally um, envisaged in the first um, decisions that were made around a native title were then hugely watered down by the Howard government um, so that native title now can be extinguished any time a mining company wants to blow up their sacred sites, as we've seen recently with the Jukun Caves. And so I don't think it offers any protection, well, it clearly offers no protection to Indigenous peoples, um, and it's not intended to. It's, it's intended to further the interests of the settler state and... So Aboriginal self-determination uh, directly threatens the settler state because uh, it, the settler atmospherics insists that it, it cannot govern with um, any other form of governance. It's exclusive. Uh, Aboriginal people were supposed to disappear from here. And so the point of being settlers is that you displace and replace and so even surviving and stepping up and saying hey no and we're still here we refuse to acknowledge your sovereignty is a radical act and I, I just yeah I, I, I don't know what it would look like that the, the kind of legal um systems that, that you're envisaging, perhaps. I don't know what they would look like. Um, I would really love to see something different happen, but I think that can only happen through a treaty process where we're acknowledging equal, uh, not equal, um, difference and, and equitable um, responses to uh, each other. And, uh, you know, as... 
children of colonialism. I don't think we're settlers don't get to ever relax about this. It's some ongoing uh, question that we need to be reflexive about. Um, Anyway, I don't want to continue to take up other people's time in responding to this, but the short answer is probably no. <laughs> um, Yvonne, Claire, do you want to say anything very quickly, just to, just to close on last closing points? No, okay. Well, look, um, I just want to take this opportunity to say thank you so much to Rachel, Yvonne, Marie and Claire for such a brilliant session tonight. I've really enjoyed it, got so much from it and I hope you have too. And um, yeah, it's been a really successful event and set of events. So thank you so much to the organisers for putting this together. And of course, this will be available um, to listen to at another later point, I'm sure. And we'll hear more about it on social media or whatever. But thanks. Thanks so much, all. <laughs>